Hi everyone, welcome back to Marine Biology at Home. This lecture, we will be learning about marine geology from Gina Roberti. Hello everyone, my name is Gina Roberti. I work as the Science Education Coordinator at the Mount St. Helens Institute, and I'm excited today to speak with you all about plate tectonics and the geology of the oceans. Shown here is a picture of some ancestors of whales that were discovered to have four legs. And I like this image, it's a beautiful illustration showing the earth as we imagine it in the past and also the context and combination of geology and oceans. This is a photograph of myself and some fun facts about me. I'm quite a rock nerd. My favorite types of rock uh, include the rock called gneiss, which I'm standing in front of in this photograph. Nice is a complex metamorphic rock and it can form from layers of ocean sediments as well as granitic and igneous rocks. I grew up near the saltwater in the estuary of Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island and my current career I specialize in communication and interpretation of geology in national parks and on public lands. One of my favorite pastimes is harvesting wild mushrooms and I'm currently growing some mushrooms in the wood chips in my backyard. Let's begin by setting the scene. Today we're speaking about geology and we're going to think about how geology and biology are linked. Here, I'm lying next to a fossil, which is a stem of an animal from the ocean called a crinoid. To the left is a photograph of crinoids taken by one of my classmates who was in Indonesia in 2011. Crinoids have been around on the earth for a long time and while they are preserved in the fossil record, we also get to see them in real life. Today we're going to speak about how geology, geologic systems, and biological systems are linked. I also want to quickly just point out that we live on the blue planet with lots of water, and it is still up for debate as to how our planet acquired so much water in the oceans. Some exciting theories, as well as to accompany this exciting illustration, include that water came from asteroids and comets colliding with the Earth, or that water was already in the mantle of the Earth's crust and came out in volcanic eruptions. Either way, it's quite exciting to think about how we went from a rocky planet to a planet that is covered with vast oceans and lots of water. Today we're going to think about the impact of geology on marine biology and ocean ecosystems. We're going to think about island formation and the habitats that different types of islands create, uh, how the oceans control the stability of our climate, the paleoclimate records, so records that help us understand what climate looked like in the past, the depth and shape of ocean basins. We're going to look at the unique life that thrives at the hydrothermal vents and also how plankton receive their food if they're living in places far from nutrients. Our essential questions today are to cover what geologic processes can help us understand the physical structure of the oceans and how does this affect the distribution and diversity of ocean life. By the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you will be able to do the following. First, to describe the origins of the major topographic features of the ocean floor, including continental shelves and slopes, spreading ridges, seamount chains, and isolated seamounts, as well as deep submarine canyons. Second, describe the age distribution of the ocean crust and explain why it is all relatively young as compared to the age of the continental crust. Third, understand the importance of nutrient cycling between oceans and continents. And finally, identify geographic settings within the ocean that are created specifically by plate tectonics and how these settings cultivate unique life. We're going to begin by describing the origins of the major topographic features of the ocean floor. Here are the three points that I hope to cover in this section of the presentation. At the end, we'll review all of these points and see if we have an understanding. Let's begin by looking at a map of our planet showing the topography, or elevation. We can see high and low places in this map, and we can see that the map of the ocean floor shows topography as varied as what we have on the continents. 
Here is a diagram showing the different types of geographic features we get within the oceans. You can see there are places with deep trenches as well as places that pop above the surface of the water such as islands. We're going to learn about all of these different features today. I pulled up this image so we could get a general sense of the variation of landforms in the oceans. Note that on this diagram, the scale is not accurate. So the artists are looking to squeeze much into one illustration. And in real life, the, both the vertical and horizontal scale are much, much greater than this diagram is able to convey. Today, we're going to dive into one of my favorite topics in geology, which is why things look the way that they do. And most of those questions can be answered through plate tectonics. Here is a diagram that I quite like. It's very colorful and a little bit complicated. And for now, I just want us to look at the diversity of plate tectonic settings and think about this diagram. We're going to come back to it and see how much of it we learned after the presentation. Notice here that this diagram is showing the interaction between the ocean crust in gray and the thick continental crust on the right side. We will learn more about these processes as we go along. One thing to note is that where we have oceans is generally where the water fills the basins above our ocean crust because the ocean crust is much heavier and denser made of heavier minerals than the continental crust, which is thick and buoyant and rises often above sea level. Let's illustrate a diagram showing the interactions between plates of the Earth's crust. Drawing is an excellent way to learn, and so I'm going to take a moment to draw out this diagram showing many of the different interactions that we have. If you have a piece of paper nearby or a notebook and you would like to draw along, please do. Our topic of the day is plate tectonics and how it informs what we see for both the geographic structure and biological structure of the oceans. Number one, we're going to highlight the ocean crust. Here, magma rises up. I drew two arrows. This is a place where two ocean plates meet, what we call a spreading center or a mid-ocean ridge. That is where magma from the mantle can rise to the surface. That creates volcanoes in the spreading centers. But there's another way that we create volcanoes, which is when an ocean plate sinks beneath a continental plate. So here on the right side, I'm drawing a thick continental plate. And when the ocean plate gets deep down, it releases water. That is these small droplets here. And that water causes the crustal rocks to melt. And that melt rises, it is buoyant and expresses itself on the surface as a volcano. The thickness of the continental crust is approximately 25 miles. We can see our big magma chamber here. And then the thickness down to where the oceanic plate is subducting is another 25 miles. In comparison, the thickness of the ocean crust is much, much thinner. Let's color in our ocean crust here. We're going to label the setting where the ocean crust is meeting the continental crust as number two. We're going to call this the accretionary wedge and trench because sediments get caught up on the ocean plate and wedged in between the ocean plate and the continental plate. The third feature of our diagram is the volcanism that occurs when the continental and oceanic plates meet. This is also called subduction zone volcanism. Let's add in another ocean plate here. When two ocean plates collide, one will sink beneath the other. And similar to what happens in the continental plate, the subducting plate releases water, that water causes melting in the rocks, and that creates an expression of volcanoes. Labeling this number four, these volcanoes we call an island arc.
because it will make a string of volcanoes and because the earth is a curve, it forms an arc shape when looked at from the air. The next feature is when sometimes the islands are underwater. We call these seamounts if they don't bridge the surface of the water. The next feature that we're going to illustrate is an area of the ocean that's relatively quiet called the abyssal plain. And finally, sometimes there's magma that rises through the ocean crust or the continental crust at places not related to the boundary between plates. And we call these hot spots. Hot spots can cause volcanoes on the surface, such as Hawaii. And that is our map of plate tectonics. Next, let's add some color to our diagram to both help us recognize these different geographic settings and also add a little bit of fun. We're going to begin by coloring the ocean in blue. Classic. And then I'm going to color in some red colored magma rising from the Earth's mantle to the surface. The magma also expresses itself in the volcanism in our continental plate. I'm going to color the continental rocks some yellow and some green shades. Recognizing we can see the different layers that get crunched in when the ocean crunches against, against the continental plate. And in between those layers you can get things wedged like islands. For each of the features I'm going to color code them here. And a little bit of poof of ash from our volcanoes. That is our plate tectonic diagram. Let's return to this diagram showing the plate tectonic settings. Now that we've taken a moment to draw them out ourselves, the settings become a little bit more familiar. We can see our spreading center or mid-ocean ridge where magma from the mantle is rising between the boundary between two oceanic plates. We can see the dense and heavy ocean crust that sinks down underneath the continental crust. And we can see the complexity of what happens when we wedge material in between the ocean and continental crust. We call these accreted terrains and they're labeled here in this diagram. We also can see the subducting ocean crust causes melting in the rocks of the continental crust and this leads to volcanism on the surface. Eventually that piece of ocean crust will become subsumed into the mantle and this illustrates how the plate tectonic processes are processes of constant creation and recycling. So new material is created at the mid-ocean ridges. When the magma rises it solidifies into new ocean rocks. And then as that plate sinks down, um, those minerals become reincorporated into the melt of the mantle and then will re-rise again. Notice also on top of our ocean crust, we have a set of islands coming down. So the atoll is just an island that has um, a crater depression in the center. And so it's more of a bow-shaped island than a classic cone-shaped island. Um, but as the little islands are formed at the mid-ocean ridge, they travel with the ocean crust down to the continental crust, and eventually some of these islands get subsumed and mixed in to the accretionary wedge and mixed in with some of the continental sediments, as well as some of the other rocks. And we can see within the accreted terrain section, there are wedges of purple and pink material, and those show some of the, um, those islands getting squeezed into the continent. And that's why we have a diversity of rocks on our continental surface when we visit um, different places across the United States that have that reflect these processes on the continental crust. We can walk through ancient rocks that used to be islands in the ocean. And it is on the conveyor belt of that subducting oceanic plate that we get some of those island rocks and materials mixed in with the continental rocks. Let's look at this map showing the topography of the Atlantic Ocean floor. Here, different colors indicate different depths. And by looking at this map, we can see there's a variety 
of depths and it's particularly shallow around the continents and you can see that there's places where it gets much deeper. The blue and purple colors are the deepest spots on this map and the reds are the most shallow. The large yellow mass in the center of the Atlantic Ocean here is Iceland which is a particularly large um, island that's formed in the midst of a spreading mid-ocean ridge. Can you take a moment to identify on this map the following locations? So we're looking for where we have a mid-ocean ridge, a continental shelf, seamounts, an abyssal plain, and a tectonic trench. Here's our answer P. So the Mid-Ocean Ridge runs through the center of the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the continental shelf is the flat and very shallow area off the coast of the continents that accumulates from lots of sediment coming off of the continents, which are much higher and thicker than the oceanic crust. Our seamounts are small islands, and we can see them, number three, some of the islands off the coast of Spain. And the abyssal plain would be in the center of that ocean plate, in the spot where we have the lowest elevation. That's where our blue and purple colors are, so number five. And our tectonic trench is the deepest location, where we have one plate going, an ocean plate going beneath another ocean plate that creates a very deep, deep point, and we can see how purple that is, number four. The next thing to cover in this section is how we make islands. So we saw that with that plate tectonic diagram, when we have one plate going underneath another, it causes melting and that melted magma rises and that creates a set of islands that we call an island arc. I like this diagram because it shows very clearly that process. We also can make islands from volcanoes just erupting, say that we have a hot spot, so it's not necessarily tied to a plate boundary, but if a volcano erupts um, and then that crater forms, the erosion around that can create islands with many different types of um, shapes. Let's go through what we hoped to accomplish in this section. First, we want to be able to identify the location of continental shelves and slopes spreading ridges, seamount chains, isolated seamounts, and deep submarine canyons from a topographic map, which we were able to do. The next goal, we were hoping to be able to draw a diagram of ocean to ocean plate subduction zone, as well as ocean to continental plate subduction zone, and describe key differences. And the final goal from this section was to be able to discuss two different geologic processes that create islands. Feel free to take time to go back in this presentation review the content to see if you can reach all of these learning goals. Here is an incredible photograph capturing a volcanic eruption underwater, which is what occurs at all of the spreading centers or those mid-ocean ridges where we have magma rising between the intersection or boundary between two oceanic plates. And that magma, when it comes up, is liquid, but when it reaches the surface, it crystallizes to form a solid. Now, some of that crystallization happens uh, beneath the surface within the conduit or chamber through which the magma is rising, but it also occurs when the magma flows out to the surface. And what's cool we can see in this photograph is that like instant crystallization as the hot magma uh, or lava interacts with the cold seawater. When rocks crystallize, they form minerals. And we can see in the photograph on the right, which is erupted from Mount St. Helens in the most recent eruption between 2004 and 2008. This is brand new baby rock. Uh, if we take a piece of rock under the microscope, it is composed of many different smaller minerals. And these minerals are made up of elements. And every mineral has a different arrangement of the elements, very linear arrangement. And these minerals will often include radioactive elements or isotopes of certain elements that are radioactive and by measuring the very uh, quantifiable rates of radioactive decay, geologists can quantify the time uh, between which the rock has been decaying since the time it formed. And that gives us an 
way to date via absolute dating the age of a rock. So we can tell when this rock went from liquid to solid or semi-molten to solid. Um, and that's very useful because all of the rocks of the ocean crust are formed through these volcanoes that line the mid-ocean ridges. And by being able to very absolutely put dates to all of the ages of the rocks, we can date the ocean floor. Another process that's captured within the rocks as they're crystallizing is the direction of magnetism on the Earth. Um, over time, the Earth's magnetic pole has reversed from being in the northern pole to the southern pole, and it will reverse back and forth. And this is a diagram which the different color squiggles here represent um, the different polarity, whether it's polarity in the north or in the south pole. And by measuring and tracking the changes in the magnetic reversals, this also is a means of dating the age of rocks on the ocean floor. As we speak about these processes, I do want to highlight one amazing female geoscientist who's really contributed so much to our present understanding of plate tectonics and ocean processes. Her name is Tanya Atwater, and I've been able to listen to her speak and she has really shaped the way we understand plate tectonics and played a role in doing the mathematics and helping to decipher those magnetic um, strip reversals that we saw in the previous slide. Here is a map showing the age of the seafloor crust. Over time, geologists can put together the data that many different people acquire from different places through dating individual rock samples at all these different places and they can put together a comprehensive map, in this case a map of our entire planet. We can see the key to the ages of the rocks are down in the lower right hand corner. So younger rocks are red colored and older rocks are pink colored. The age goes from 0 to 280 and the unit is in millions of years, so it's 0 to 280 million years ago. So for example, green colors represent ages that are between 60 and 90 million years ago. That's still quite a lot of time. And we are talking about some old rocks. Geologists use the uh, shortcut NA to represent millions of years. Let's take a moment to look at this map and See if you can determine where the oldest seafloor is located. Using the key at the bottom, we can see a couple of different places where we have old seafloor. One of them in the Mediterranean. This is actually the oldest, 280 million years old. And then another location in the Pacific Ocean. In the Mediterranean Ocean, we have this small slice of ocean plate that's caught between many continents, and so it's not able to subduct down into the mantle and become reincorporated into the mantle. So it still survives and it's exciting. And then in the Pacific Ocean, that location of very old ocean plate is due to the fact that that is one of the furthest places from the spreading center of the subduction zone. Um, sorry, the furthest places from the spreading center and thus that allows us to preserve very old rock there. Our next question is to look for where you can find a place where the ocean crust is forming most rapidly. And we can see that one of those locations is off the coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean at a place called the East Pacific Rise. There are different rates at which ocean crust forms, which has to do with how large the ocean plates are. If they're really large plates, they become heavier over time as they cool, as the rock cools, and that will pull the plate away from the mid-ocean ridge and actually allow more magma to rise. And so the Pacific plates are particularly large, the largest plates that we have on our Earth. And so they, the spreading rates are much faster than smaller oceanic plates like what we see in the Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Northwest of the United States is one place where we have subduction zone, active subduction occurring between an ocean plate and a continental plate. Let's take a look at a map 
showing the age of the ocean plate and see if we can read and understand that map. Our question is, what is the age of the plate that is subducting beneath Seattle, Washington today? So let's take a look at this diagram. There's three different plates represented. The North American plate is the tan color, Pacific plate is blue, and Juan de Fuca plate is green. Looking at the key, we can see that different colors on the Juan de Fuca plate represent the age in millions of years. So we have rocks that are two million years old, blue, or five million years old is green. Question is, how old is the oldest part of this Juan de Fuca plate that is subducting beneath the North American continental plate? And then how old is the youngest part of the Juan de Fuca plate that is subducting beneath the North American continental plate? So take a moment and see if you can answer both of these questions. We can see the oldest part is going to be the red section on the Juan de Fuca plate, about 8 million years old. And the youngest bit of crust that's subducting beneath us, actually it's subducting under Vancouver, British Columbia, is only a couple of million years old. How does the age of rocks of the ocean crust compare to that of the age of rocks of the continental crust? We take a look at the center of North America by the Great Lakes. We can see that the ages are in, um, multiple orders of magnitude larger. So moving from two to eight million years old, we're moving up to 200 million years old, 400 million years old, and then some of the old, old rocks in the center of North America are billions of years old. And we can see three and a half billion years old. The ages for some of the rocks in upper Wisconsin. That leads to the question, why do continents preserve much older rocks than the oceans? This is because the continents are more buoyant and they don't sink down into the mantle the same way that the ocean crust does. Every time a piece of ocean crust comes in contact, every time an ocean plate comes in contact with a continental plate, it will deposit we saw some of those islands and it will push material together and we call the um, coming together of all this material accretion and we call strips of rocks that share similar geologic history terrain so a common way to describe this process is accretionary terrains and we can see if we look at this map of alaska here that alaska and western canada british columbia uh, is that land, that continental plate is built from the accumulation of many smaller geologic fragments that have been pushed one into another. And the cross section on the left side shows what it looks like if we were just, just cut across this landscape. You can see the different colors representing different rocks. So one way that continents preserve older rocks than the oceans is because of the process of terrain accretion. Secondly, as we mentioned earlier, the ocean crust is heavy and dense and it easily sinks back down into the mantle. What's really neat is some really recent geology uh, that's been going on. This, these are studies of a field called tomography, which is a way of imaging beneath the earth, kind of like a CAT scan, using high resolution seismic imagery and there's some amazing work that's been done just in the last 15 years or so that's really reshaped the way we think about plate tectonics and what i'm showing on the right side is a cross section of the united states and underneath we have an area we have different colors the red colors represent um, warmer areas and the blue and green colors represent areas where there's a colder piece um, or a more solid piece. And we can see that there is this big green bulge that goes down all, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And folks who interpret these tomographic maps interpret this to be the remnant of the Juan de Fuca plate that's currently subducting off the coast of Seattle. Just an extension of that going all the way down and over time as it sinks, sinks, sinks deeper into the mantle 
the material, the minerals dissolve and become reincorporated into um, not completely liquid, but more of a semi-molten state of the mantle. The map on the left side shows that fragment of the remaining Juan de Fuca plate. We can see just a small piece of it is left and uh, much of it now is with moving down into the mantle underneath North America. Let's review what our goals were for this section. We want to understand how geologists are able to quantify the age of the ocean and the continental crust. We want to identify places on our planet that contain the oldest and youngest oceanic crust. And we want to be able to describe why the ocean crust is so much younger than the continental crust. Let's move on to our next topic. Next, we want to look at and understand the importance of nutrient cycling between the oceans and the continents. We have four different points to cover here. First, we're going to learn about specific nutrients that cycle between marine and continental systems. We're going to learn about how certain nutrients, such as iron and phosphorus, are cycled. We're going to learn about the carbon cycle in the oceans and the impact on the global climate system. And we're going to describe the importance of plankton in the paleoclimate record. Let's begin with this beautiful photograph showing a large plankton bloom off the coast of Norway, up in the Brent Sea. The bright like teal colors are the photosynthetic algae and we can see them swirling with the different currents here. The question is, for plankton that are living way out in the ocean, what do they need to survive? Like any living organism, they need to build their DNA and body structures with elements and nutrients. There are some major nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, and there are minor nutrients, potassium, calcium, sodium, as well as trace minerals, iron, zinc, cobalt, copper, manganese. All of these elements are important for building the structures that living organisms need to survive. And in the ocean, it's somewhat very difficult to come across these elements. So the question is, where do plankton get their nutrients? Here's a beautiful photograph, both of these taken from satellites showing dust coming off the Sahara Desert on the left and blowing across Europe, this uh, Spain and Portugal, on the photograph on the right. We can see the teal blue of the plankton bloom on the right, and I just labeled England, Spain, and Portugal for us to give some context for what we're looking at. From these satellite images, we can see there's quite a large amount of material that is airborne, and that airborne material blows off the continents and then dumps into the oceans. Rivers also transport a lot of material into the oceans. And what's important to recognize here is that we're talking about bits of rock, dust, ash. These are inorganic material that's blowing into the ocean and then the organisms in the ocean can break down those bits of rock, ash, and dust into the nutrients that they need to use. Here is a diagram showing some of the ways in which nutrients cycle throughout the ocean. And we can see, uh, starting in the left corner, that some of those elements that are important for life, but not necessarily abundant in the oceans, such as iron and aluminum, are in relatively small concentrations, but they cycle in through dust, down through dissolution into the upper part of the ocean, and then they're uptaken by plankton and other organisms, and that brings those elements into the biological chain when organisms eat each other and then die and then other organisms decompose, the elements get cycled throughout the system. There's also a source of other elements from hydrothermal vents that would be at our mid-ocean ridges and other places where we have volcanoes erupting on the seafloor. Upwelling is a process that we can bring minerals and nutrients that are very far from the seafloor up. And upwelling occurs from currents, and there's some places in the world with very, very productive areas because of strong currents of upwelling. And then 
These elements also come in from sediments off the continent, as we mentioned in river systems, for example. Finally, a very small portion comes from sea ice and the melting of icebergs, because often that ice can, will contain um, living, organisms, living organisms from the air, bacteria, and every living organism contains a little bit of nitrogen and carbon and other elements. Here's a picture of some of the plankton up close. We're going to begin with diatoms. Diatoms are fondly called jewels of the sea. And I like to show these pictures of plankton because it really highlights what the organisms use to build their physical structure. They use uh, elements that come from our minerals. So diatoms build their shells out of silica. And diatoms are an important type of phytoplankton. They make up a significant portion of the Earth's biomass and generate about 20 to 50% of the oxygen produced on the planet each year. Diatoms contribute to nearly half of the organic material in our oceans. And because they rely on silica, they're very important in the cycling of these nutrients. A little aside, you can do some research on your own to the connection between diatoms and the evolution of grasslands. Grasses have very high concentrations of silica and there's some um, research that suggests that the rise of grasslands in North America uh, correlated with the rise of diatoms in the oceans. Here's an example of another type of planktonic organism called radiolarians. They also build, in quotes, little glass houses, so darling, and they also use the element silica. And silica is an element that is abundant in rocks and minerals. It's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And it's important to recognize that these critters living in the ocean need to get the silica from somewhere. And so that has to come from rocks from somewhere. So either rocks erupting on the ocean floor or um, material that's blown in from the air or brought in by rivers. The accumulation of dead plankton on the ocean floor is really important for tracking many things, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but with radiolarians, they can be used for geologic dating, and that also they can speak about past environments, and by knowing past environments of deposition, where sediments and plankton are accumulating, that can help elucidate whether we have, for example, oil. And a quick note about petroleum, it is formed from the compaction of the organic material from plankton, and so where you have rich areas with plankton that are able to be preserved in a certain way, you can get large petroleum reserves. And that's very important for economic geology and all of us, all the products that we use in our contemporary world. And here's a picture showing what does happen to all of the plankton at the surface as they die, they fall to the bottom, they get eaten, there are plankton throughout the water column and then lots of plankton on the ocean floor um, that lots of organisms on the ocean floor that work to break them down but over time there's so much production throughout the water column that that creates substantial layers on the bottom and this creates beautiful rocks when we get to see them on the surface to the picture to the right is some folded what's called fondly ribbon chert and chert is one type of rock that forms from uh, a layer with very high concentrations of silica. So if you have lots of diatoms and radiolarians dying in one place, then you will create a layer in the sedimentary record and that can create rocks that um, are rich in silica and chert is very, can be very, very colorful. Here's another diagram showing nutrient cycling in the oceans and I just pulled this up to highlight again the different elements that are at play. So we see here there's N representing nitrogen, Fe for iron, PO for phosphates, um, and these are all important elements for cycling and biological productivity in the oceans. Another very important cycle that occurs in the oceans is the carbon cycle, and this is particularly important for us to learn about right now as carbon is um, more and more uh, part of our 
world in terms of trying to mitigate our impacts on the climate system and recognizing what a large role the oceans play in the carbon cycle can help us understand and mitigate our own impact as humans. There's a major carbon cycle in the oceans, but it is slow. So the carbon comes in from the weathering or breaking down of rocks that contain the element calcium. That calcium comes in and with uh, carbon from both the CO2 in the atmosphere as well as carbon that might come from other plankton or the breaking down of biology in the water column. That creates, organisms use that to create calcium carbonate, which makes their shells. That calcium carbonate can be cycled through the water column for a bit, but eventually a lot of it is sequestered away. It sinks down and forms sediments, and the sediments at the bottom accumulate to form sedimentary rocks, and that takes the carbon that's in the atmosphere and brings it down and turns it into a rock. And then that carbon is not released until those rocks reach the surface of the continent and are broken down and that can be for many many millions or hundreds of millions of years so the ocean x is a long-term and very slow carbon sink and carbon reservoir through the process of sedimentation on the ocean floor here's a photograph of one of my favorite types of little ocean creatures called foraminifera there are foriums that live both up at the surface of the ocean, we call these uh, benthic, and then there's foriums that live at the bottom of the ocean, we call these pelagic. And they generally build their little home shells out of calcium carbonate. So again, using that calcium and part of the carbon cycle. They are found all over the ocean, including in some of the deepest places, such as the Mariana Trench. And when they die, they uh, can create thick layers on the ocean floor. Their distribution all across the oceans and through time, they've been around for quite some time in the evolutionary record, um, make them really excellent markers for paleoclimate dating. We geologists use foriums for, uh, to, they have developed very high precision models and there's such an exceptional fossil record for 4 AMs that allows uh, much of the paleoclimate work that we do to be based off of these little creatures. I had the opportunity to work in a laboratory at Brown University in which, uh, with Dr. Timothy Herbert, who was studying 4 AMs, and he quantified a way to tie the chemistry within different species of foriums to um, be able to tell sea surface temperature. So along with telling um, different compositions and chemistry of the ocean over time, foriums can give information about even the temperature of the ocean. And that is really important for us as we model past climate and then try to model how the climate changes in the future. Here's a graph showing our information about climate change in the past and that information comes both from um, ice cores but also from benthic foraminifera and you can see that the ice core record is in light blue and then the, um, the oxygen isotope temperature record comes from these little foriums and that would be the dark blue large curve at the bottom and we can see it's a very robust curve so foriums are super important in our current um, climate of trying to discern the paleoclimate. I wanna highlight besides foriums, geologists use an abundance of different biological and geological records in the ocean to be able to infer what conditions were like in the past. And I really like this diagram. There's a lot of detail here, but it speaks to both microfossils um, debris that gets caught up in glaciers and ice sheets as well as the chemistry and all of these different proxies that can be used for dating. That concludes our work in this section so let's review and see what we learned about nutrient cycling in the oceans. We should be able to list specific nutrients and elements that marine ecosystems obtain from continental systems. Describe how mineral-derived nutrients such as iron and phosphorus are cycled through the oceans. And illustrate how carbon is cycled in the oceans and the importance of the global climate system. 
as well as to describe the importance of plankton in establishing the paleoclimate record. Our final section is to identify geographic settings within the ocean created by plate tectonics that cultivate unique life. We're going to describe how plate tectonic settings create distinct ecological settings, describe the difference of physical features that characterize ecosystems on the continental shelves versus deep in the ocean trenches, describe the unique chemical and biological environments that exist at the mid-ocean ridges where we have hydrothermal vents, and explain why the geography of the oceans is constantly changing. To do this, we're going to return to our big diagram of plate tectonics and think about the different factors that influence the type of life in different settings. There are many things that can affect life if we look at the different types of settings represented in this diagram. The depth of the water affects the availability of sunlight. The stability of the environment, whether we have an active volcanic environment or a place where there's lots of landslides and high turnover. The sedimentation and nutrient availability, so where nutrients are coming from, and if there are sources of, again, those rocks from which we derive the elements necessary for life. And also the distance of our sources from other forms of life, so really remote island chains can, chains can have unique biological communities. And remote islands can form, again, due to plate tectonic factors, such as if you had a hot spot. Here's a generalized diagram showing how life zones in the ocean are constrained by light and nutrients. So we have the thick continental shelf on the left side, and then that will turn into a much deeper ocean. And we have different types of organisms living in different places, and a lot of it depends on how much light and nutrients are able to penetrate the different zones. This diagram shows some of the exciting features of being on the edge of the continental shelf. There are large canyons there, and I encourage you to look up some uh, photographs of this. There recently um, was a preserve created off the coast of Nova Scotia um, to preserve some of the really unique geological and biological settings at the edge of the continental shelf. When sediment comes off from the continent, it builds up on the shelf and occasionally it will release in large underwater debris slides. And these are measurable and actually get preserved in the rock record and we can see them in rocks on the continents, which is very exciting. Some marine environments are extreme in the settings that they create and this leads to pretty strange forms of life. I want to highlight the Mariana Trench which is the deepest location on our planet and it is over six and a half miles deep. If Mount Everest was uh, at the bottom, Everest would still be covered in 7,000 feet of water. And this little illustration shows some of the diversity of life forms down at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Plate tectonics and volcanoes create an abundance of islands and this means an abundance of habitats. We can see in the topographic map to the right that there are so many different island chains in the Pacific Ocean, and this is due to the plate tectonics that form these. Picture of an atoll to the left is a volcanic island that's lost its top, and that creates a habitat that allows for large reef formation, and reefs are some of the most biologically productive areas on our planet. Most exciting to me, perhaps, is the unique life that forms at our mid-ocean ridges. Again, where two ocean plates are spreading apart and new magma is coming up. And these are large chains of volcanoes that run through the center of our oceans. And at these mid-ocean ridges, because we have volcanism, we have some really unique chemical conditions. And this leads to very unique um, types of life that live there. Specifically, folks call the features, the volcanic features at mid-ocean ridges can be called hydrothermal vents. And this is any time that seawater will meet the extruding lava. Um, and as minerals in the lava cool and react with seawater, they can create and build up a chimney-like structure. And this gives these vents the name smokers. These features were first discovered in 1977 by Robert Ballard, very famous. Um, diver and researcher from the University of Rhode Island. 
and he discovered them outside of the Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America. Hydrothermal vents are important because they have a completely different chemistry than most of the rest of the ocean, and so a unique set of chemophiles, so organisms that are adapted to processing instead of sunlight, um, the methane and other elements that are coming out of these places, the chemophiles live. There are two types of smokers. There's black smokers and white smokers, and this depends a little bit on the chemistry of what's coming out, but generally uh, the black ones have more iron. And I thought I'd throw this in just to show the really complex uh, chemical cycles that are happening at hydrothermal vents. Take a look at the abundance of letters here in this diagram. That's really the takeaway. We have HE, helium, MN, manganese, hydrogen, silicon, oxygen, iron. Um, we have sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, sulfates, magnesium, copper, calcium, potassium, lithium. Again, remember that these are all the elements that life needs, we all need in our DNA and the other structures of our cells. And so hydrothermal vents are one place where we have the um, raw chemical soup coming up and then other organisms, these elements get cycled through the system to get out to other organisms. Plate tectonics are important for our oceans and it's important to recognize that nothing in the ocean or anywhere on our planet is quite ever static. Um, the plates are moving and so the location of our spreading ridges and where we have the volcanoes is constantly moving. And I like this diagram because it shows what would happen if we were to um, fast forward our current plate tectonic regime and go 50 million years into the future where things would be. So we would see that Africa and Asia have moved together into one continent and there's um, some changes in what we see. The plate off of the coast of Western North America has totally shifted. And these predictions or models are really fun to look at. There's a great video online showing plate tectonic model for what might happen 250 million years in the future. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Let's review and see what we learned about geographic settings within the oceans that are created by plate tectonics and this effect on life. First, we want to be able to describe how plate tectonic settings create distinct ecological settings. Second, describe the difference of physical features that characterize ecosystems on continental shelves versus at deep ocean trenches. And describe the unique chemical and biological environments of deep sea hydrothermal vents. Finally, we want to be able to explain why the geography of the oceans is constantly changing. Thank you so much for joining me in this presentation and here are some resources if you would like to learn more. Thank you all for watching and as always, if you have any questions, you can go to our Facebook group and we will do our best to help you out. These are some of the people working behind the scenes on this lecture series. If you want to contact any of them, be sure to send a message to the Marine Biology at Home Facebook. And finally, if you or anyone you know would like to create a lecture or assist with online learning in any way, don't hesitate to shoot us a message.